Yep. Give me one second. Um, so the um, first things first, um, you know, we received a, um, uh, a message from, uh, I think, Davis, who was asking about setting up the virtual machine um, in order to get the Python environment um, up and running. And so I, I kind of wanted to start today just with a, a very brief note on like, how to um, do this stuff in the easiest way possible. Um, I've got a, a couple of tabs open here um, to, to um, introduce the idea of using um, uh, integrated development environments uh, rather than trying to do everything out of you know, a tech document, running it through Windows PowerShell or something like that. And so I wanted to recommend, uh, well, not necessarily recommend, but uh, show um, four different options um, that I think are sort of the, some of the best out there. And you know, uh, if someone's got a, a a better suggestion, then please feel free to uh, write it in the comments. Um, the Anaconda um, is a, a, a seriously good um, uh, sort of generic uh, IDE. Uh, this one runs out of your um, out of your browser. I can show you what that looks like, maybe. Uh, here we go. Um, and so yeah, this is uh, you know this is what it looks like. Um, and you can see that it's just running on a, a tab in my um, in my browser, um, and so you don't need sort of any special uh, you know any special programs running on your PC or anything. Um, it just has this little um, you know it creates kind of a virtual server um, that you know that your your browser um, communicates with, um, and you can access kind of you know all of your um, all of the things on your um, on your on your computer through here and, and create files however you want to you just click new here and, and start in the Python kernel or whatever it is um, so this is a, a very very convenient way um, to to do things um, and so you know I've I've used this um, product before and I think it's it's really terrific so um, Anaconda is is very good um, I also use um, Viesco um, and this is a so this is a Microsoft resource. Um, I think it's it's basically free for for everyone. Um, I can't remember if there might be some like enterprise level um, features and things that you probably aren't interested in any, anyway. But as a single user, you can just download it from here. It supports um, you know Windows, Unix, and Linux systems as well as that. Um, Sublime Text is actually how I um, how I learned to use Python in the beginning. Uh, I find this to be an extremely um, intuitive uh, IDE to use, and so. Um, I, I also recommend um, Sublime Text. I think it, it's terrific. Um, it's technically a paid service, but they have a perpetual, um, you know, free trial period, similar to uh, WinZip or something like that. So you can you can download it and just use it forever. Uh, Python is a, a lot like Sublime Text, but um, from a, a different publisher. Um, so you know, if you're struggling to get your virtual machine up and running. Um, I would recommend just going with one of these kind of out of the box solutions. Uh, they're extremely convenient. There's really no reason to do anything the hard way. Um, you know, uh, I think VS Code is, is, is um, probably the, the most feature rich one. It's extremely well supported. Um, and then on top of that, I also wanted to show you that the um, the Python organization actually has this thing called the Python tutorial, which you can access at, at python.org. Um, and there's uh, an extremely comprehensive, um, you know, uh, list of resources here that sort of introduce um, the, the main um, functionality and theory behind the Python programming language. Uh, but then on top of that, and this one's actually slightly better, uh, Web3 Resource has compiled a, um, a whole bunch of exercises um, in Python. Um, I think. Uh, They've sourced all of these from Stack Exchange, which is a really great, um, a really great resource as well. But if you click on these, essentially what they do is they just give you some tasks, right? In this case, it's to write a Python program to print the following string in a specific format, right? So it's the twinkle, twinkle, little star lyrics. Um, but they want it with these particular indentations, and they want it to print it out. And each one of these, there's 150 just in this group. You can um, click. And it will take you through a um, a work solution, and these solutions have been you know verified and they all work. They even explain a little bit about 
you know, why the solution um, was set up to, to do the, you know, why, why the solution works or you know, how to fit through a programming solution like this one. Um, so I think that, you know, these uh, are really terrific resources. And I was just reminded that, um, you know, that, that uh, if you don't know this material is out there and you're sort of learning to program for the first time, um, that it can seem a little bit fabulous and, and inaccessible. And, and these things um, certainly make it more acceptable. So in summary, um, don't screw around with you know, writing your programs in, in text files and try to run them out of the PowerShell. Just go and download one of these IDEs. They're, they're going to make your life so much easier. And if you are new to Python programming, I strongly recommend the Python tutorial by the Python organization. And then the, um, the uh, Python exercise is offered by uh, Web3 resources, which you, know, you can spend your whole life going through these exercises and never finish them. There's so many. Uh, Mark, that just re way. real quick, uh, before you yeah. before you jump into this next section, uh, I just wanted to clarify um, two minor uh, things in, in what you were just talking about. So Anaconda is actually uh, subtly different than like uh, VS Code or, or PyCharm, right? Anaconda is actually um, like uh, will, will be kind of like the Python environment running in the back of one of those IDEs. So like... There's virtual M, which is like a virtual environment, um, and in Anaconda's, um, Anaconda's basically uh, something like that, where um, where you know it will run its own environment and also provides a like a pip installer type of um, you know package manager where you can just call conda install you know something instead of pip install. So um, it they're not materially different, it, you know, like I, I think like the, the spirit of what you're saying is correct. I just wanted to, um, to clarify that, that point on the Anaconda side. So, yeah. Yeah, if anyone was wondering, right, an Anaconda is just a very large Python. And, um, you know, it kind of describes the product in the sense that it's, it's Python, but with all of this extra stuff added to it, but all of the major repositories and dependencies are kind of already installed. So you don't need to sort of, um, you know, go through the, the hassle of anyone who's dealt with dependencies before of, of getting these things done, although, you know, Python doesn't generally struggle with that. But yeah, thank you, Mike. Very helpful comment. Okay, so um, for today's um, uh, for today's lecture, I think, where we basically got to the end of um, putting tokens into the vault um, in the last um, in the last call. And so what we're going to be uh, jumping into now is this trading and fees section. And I've noted here um, in the um, in the Bit15 document that the equations that are, that are written in this document, they are true, um, but they're not the method that is used in the contract. And so if you're ever um, you know, going through the, the, um, the simulator and you see that the, or, or the smart contracts themselves, and you see that the, uh, there's actually just one swap function there, that is called uh, twice during a double hop trade, for example. Um, that's not a mistake. Um, it, it achieves the same thing. And the equations that I've written here just describe the overall process in, in a single equation. Um, but the actual contracts don't use these equations correctly. Instead, they, um, they use uh, a different set of equations that achieve exactly the same thing, but just make it uh, a little bit easier to, to implement. Um, so there's a couple of things that we that we need to look at here. Um, and for anyone that's familiar with AMM, members, so hopefully um, this is going to be relatively intuitive. But essentially, when a, when a trade is performed, there's a whole bunch of things that have to happen in a, in a particular order. Um, the most important, obviously, is that the trader's um, token balance on, on the token that they are filling is going to go down and the token balance for the token that they purchased is going to go up, right? And that's, that's probably not controversial. Um, and then, of course, the opposite needs to happen inside the vault, right? If the trader is giving tokens up, um, then those tokens have to go somewhere. So we need to maintain a vault balance somewhere else. And then uh, the vault balance of the tokens that the trader is receiving needs to go down so that the, um, the overall state of the, the system, including the trader, remains uh, constant throughout that trade. Um, and so you know, but the trading liquidity is on the top, and that needs to be adjusted so that the um, so that price discovery can, 
is, is taking place as, um, as expected. Um, but then for Bank World Version 3, we also have these, these other components, right? We've also got the staking ledger, which is the thing that keeps track of um, the protocol's obligations to users, and the Vortex ledger, which is the, um, the, the trading fees or the network fees that are collected by the protocol in order to finance itself. Um, and so I wanted to show you sort of um, some of my early uh, what they look like here. Um, and you know we can uh, we can go through a lot of this stuff. Um, we're going to go through a lot of this stuff slightly uh, slightly later in the course. Um, there are really three specific um, three specific situations that we need to consider for for this um, for this call today, and that is a, a trade exclusively from BNT into TKN, uh, a trade from TKN into BNT, and then the double hop trade of TKN to TKN. And so you can see here, right, I've got, um, you know, don't worry about my color coding and everything else. This is just for my benefit. But you can see that there's all of these different kinds of things here that we need access to. And the simulator and the smart contracts obviously need to, to have all of these things, all of these different objects. Um, the pool constant here is actually something that we can hide because we don't actually use that uh, in any of the calculations of the front of smart contracts. But everything else here is, is still true. Um, and so we've got, for a certain pool, we're going to have two reserves of tokens, right? The BNT reserve and the TKN reserve. Um, we then also have, of course, a, a pool fee associated with that that the trader pays. And there's going to be a certain amount of network fee um, from which you know, it extracts a small amount of value from the pool fee or whatever that is. And so you can see here that what I've done is kind of expand the section out um, so that we've got the, the trader who is you know, swapping a certain amount of BNT and receiving an amount of, of TKN in return based on whatever I'm simulating over here. Um, we've got the, um, we're also keeping track of the TKN fee paid by the trader, the amount of that TKN fee that's given to stakers, and then the amount of uh, BNT that's given to the Vortex. And so there's, there's quite a lot happening here. So even though we've got only, you know, uh, so we, let's, update this and to show what happens when we're, we're swapping 10 BNTs, you can see then that we're, um, we're producing 22 TKN based on this, um, based on these parameters. And during that trade, right, so the trader gives up 10, 10 BNT and receives 22 TKN, which means that we now know that the vault balance needs to go up by 10 BNT and needs to go down by 22.8 TKN. But we also need to have a look at, okay, these TKN fees that are, are, are being distributed across the system and how is, how is that compensated for? We've got the, the final state of the pool over here. Um, and yeah, essentially, I just wanted to sort of bring your attention to the fact that even though a trade seems like such a simple operation, there are actually like about a dozen different things that need to uh, be appropriately handled um, in, in the contracts in order to keep the system uh, running the way it's supposed to. Um, we've also got the opposite situation here where we can have TKN being swapped to BNP. Uh, you can see I've got these same objects, right? We've got this, the, the pool reserves over here. We've got one for BNP, one for TKN. We've still got the pool fee and the vortex fee, and we can change these numbers if we want to in order to simulate uh, different effects or different settings um, to fine tune the, the economics of the system. Um, and again, we're looking at the, the, BNT, um, the BNT fees that are being collected over here and the amount of BNT given to the vortex. One of the things that I did want to point out here is that because the, um, the fee is always taken from the target asset, if someone is buying a TKN, then it's the TKN stickers that are receiving the fee. Um, whereas if someone is buying BNT, such as in this situation, then it's the BNT stakers that are receiving the fee. And that's always necessarily true. However, when you're swapping BNT to TKN, because of the vortex, um, the, um, there's going to be a small amount of this TKN that needs to be routed back through the pool um, in order to generate BNT and add that to the vortex as well. So the vortex is always collecting um, its own fees in BNT. So there's really quite a lot going on here. Um, and it gets even complicated when you're looking at a TKN to TKN trade, because now um, in, the, in the, the first part, right, the part up here, we've got uh, one TKN 
is being traded across these bulls, and they have got their own reserves. Um, we need to calculate the amount of uh, BNT that's coming out of that pool, which is then the amount of BNT that's going into another pool. So you can see on when I was researching this, I was considering uh, two BNT reserves versus an ETH reserve and a WBTC reserve. Um, and each one has uh, its own swap fee, right? We can change the, the swap fee on each pool individually. Um, if we really want to, we can change the vortex fee on each pool individually as well. Um, although the, the actual network doesn't support that. And then we've got, um, this means that we're collecting fees in BMT on the first trade and fees in TKM on the second trade. Um, but both of these are resulting in BMT being collected um, by a reverse trade, at least in the first part and directly in the second part. Um, BMT being collected and given to the Vortex directly. And so we need to keep track of you know, how much uh, BMT is being generated in both of these situations and then what's the total across that trade. So you can think of this situation, even though it's a single trade, TKN to TKN, it's really just two separate trades, right? The first one being TKN to BNT, and then the second one being BNT to TKN. And so um, this is the thing I want, I want you to keep in mind when we're going into the simulator at the moment, is that, you know, when a trade is taking place, okay, we need, a, we need a trader, we need to know what their token balances are. We need a pool, we need to know what its reserves balance, what its virtual reserves are. We need a token vault. We need to know what its balances are. And we need to know the staking ledger and the vortex ledger. And all of these things have value and they're going to change during a trade. And so I'm going to hand the, uh, the floor over the mic now. And we're going to have a look at, uh, in a much more beautiful uh, context, right, how the, the simulator can perform these calculations given your command. And show you what the, the result is of those um, uh, the what the result is of those commands. Great. Okay. So um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to clear the um, output here, and we've got um, a series of notebooks going in the repo. If um, if you're not aware, uh, you can um, you can go to the, the Bancor re, repo, um, go to examples and artifacts, and that's uh, where we're kind of keeping a running tab of uh, the code examples that, that we cover. So um, you can refer there to, to grab this code, um, and I will uh, commit this notebook um, after we're done with this call as well. So um, we're gonna start this out, I guess, with, um, uh, kind of going in line with with what Mark um, touched on at the beginning, which is once you've got your um, your environment set up, you know I'm I'm going to go ahead and uh, not formally recommend Anaconda, but it, it probably is the the easiest way to just make sure you get um, to get things set up correctly. And uh, but you could use you know virtual M for or any other virtual environment. Once that's running and you're able to um, to just open a Jupyter notebook and it looks something like this, um, you can just use this command right here, this Python dash m pip install upgrade Bancor research. And this is like if you had already installed the package, uh, calling this upgrade should uh, make sure that you go and fetch the newest version um, if there's been any updates since then. And using this Python dash m just ensures that like whatever Python environment um, you're currently running uh, is where the um, where the package will actually be installed because if, if you don't run this I have had um, some confusing you know installation paths happen before and it might not necessarily go to the environment um, that you're currently working in so if you um, if you go and you run that you should see something like um, this happen well hopefully uh, let me try to refresh this. I ran this a couple times before. There we go. Okay. Uh, so you should see it install. Um, and uh, once you've got that, you can kind of check the version. You can see here I'm running version 3.0.9. Um, we can go ahead and import the, uh, the classes that we were uh, previously working with and just a little bit of a review and consolidation from the previous sessions 
Uh, we, we initialize our, our main simulator class, the Bancor DAP, um, and we call that V3. And then, um, then we whitelist some additional tokens, which, um, which you know, are not uh, initialized to begin with or, or not whitelisted to begin with. Um, we create a user Alice and we, give, we set Alice's um, user wallet balance for, um, for each of you know, the different tokens that we've whitelisted. And we do the same thing for a user named Bob who we create and give him the same amount of tokens. And then at the very end, we call describe to, to kind of get the system state. Um, once, we've, um, once we've done this, we can see everything is zeroed out um, across, you know, like the, the staking ledger balance, the BNT and TK and trading liquidity, um, the different rates and, and so on and so forth, our master vault. Um, we can see the user balances have updated and, um, and so we're good to go from there. Uh, last session directly, we, um, we covered deposits. And so this is just kind of taking everything, um, adding it into to one cell in Jupyter Notebook here. So it's easier to see, uh, we can create a timestamp zero and make a couple of deposits. And then we iterate the timestamp. So timestamp equals one. We make uh, another deposit and then we call enable trading on um, on the tokens uh, and and then call describe. And let's uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, you can see that that we've um, updated the balances and the different ledgers um, accordingly. And um, and we can even call show history to uh, to kind of see how this played out, you know, over um, the different timestamps here. And so um, this will also, you know, tell you whether or not trading was enabled at, um, at the particular um, point in time you are and, and also uh, referencing the top columns to, um, to note which, which, um, which balance you're looking at. Um, so now we come down to trades, and, and this is where we're you know, formally um, starting our discussion today. So uh, Mark, um, it, it, I, I wanna mention other, one other thing as, as we go to get started here. Um, if you go into uh, the examples folder, you'll see that there are all these other example notebooks here. And there's a couple of them called like trading BNT to TKN, trading TKN to BNT, and trading TKN to TKN. These uh, notebooks actually follow along exactly with, um, with the examples in BIP15 that Mark was just referring to. And so you, um, you should be able to reference these notebooks and, and follow along um, with the examples uh, that, that are laid out in BIP15 and kind of go um, use them as, as like a hand in hand study guide, if you will, to, um, to both get familiar with, um, with the V3 uh, workings as well as how to uh, make the simulator do what you want it to do. Um, so with that, I'm not going to focus on, on exactly replicating the example that, um, that Mark was just alluding to during the call, but I do encourage you to, um, to, to go ahead and uh, to look at like the, the trading BNT to TKN notebook, um, there's, there's a little bit of additional functionality that is called out in here. So I, I don't wanna get um, too far into it today, but um, so, so we'll keep it simple, but, but feel free to check that out. And maybe um, on a future call, we can, uh, we can go through those notebooks um, in more detail. So uh, we can just, again, we, we put in a timestamp of, um, you know, w whatever we're uh, interested in looking at, some amount to be traded, and the source token, uh, the target token, the user, and the timestamp. And then we can call describe and, um, and look and see, uh, you know, what has happened to, um, to these different balances, right? And so here we're, we're trading BNT um, to link, and we can see that uh, our BNT balance has uh, 
Alice's BNT balance has dropped by 50. Um, and we can see that um, her, her link balance has gone up by, um, by some amount, which is uh, you know, corresponding to that trade. And we can um, look at the different system updates um, that happen throughout this, uh, throughout this process. The one uh, caveat that I did notice uh, you know, just a couple minutes before the call um, was that we need to, um, you, you, the vortex ledger balance is missing from this display, but um, that's something that um, I'll probably just add right after this call and, um, and push up a change so that, so that the vortex balance will also display here, um, which is you know, what it was doing for quite a long time, but um, we, we made some changes to the system as a whole, so that seems to have gotten lost in the mix. Uh, nonetheless, uh, just about everything you need here, aside from the vortex balance is shown. Um, we can go through and do the opposite uh, trade, this time with Bob, so we'll go link to BNT um, for, for uh, a quantity of 50, um, TKN now, we can see that Bob's balance um, is, is changing and uh, link drops by 50. And we can um, you know, look, at, look at the different associated um, staking ledger, master vault, um, and, and so on is, is now changing for both of these tokens. And one last time, now we can do a, a link uh, to ETH trade. So this is what we, what in BIP15 is referred to as TKN to TKN. Um, and what effectively happens is uh, we're doing two trades, um, you know, from, from basically uh, link to, um, to BNT and then BNT to ETH. Uh, in, and that's what's happening behind the scenes, right? So the process is still um, the, the same, you know, user interface or the same action for, for you as a simulator user. You just call trade. You don't have to worry about doing um, the two hop, uh, the two hop action. It'll just you know handle that for you automatically in the background. But do be aware that that, that is um, what's what's actually happening. And um, and again, we can see that that more and more of these balances are now um, starting to populate. We can track. Um, you know the the different EMA and, and um, spot rates and you know uh, funding amounts and trading liquidity and staking balance. All these different things are are updating with each action. And um, and again, this is what you would want to follow through. Uh, you know, when I first started, um, you, you know this this process of building the simulator. Really, what I did is I just uh, worked through the Bit15 document like um, exclusively and just tried to make sure that to um, you know a, the, create a user and and this user performs such an action and this is the balances that that need to result and um, and really that's the exact process that uh, that I followed getting um, up to speed with with how V3 works and and building the simulator itself so. Um, highly recommended to, to kind of um, use that approach. Uh, we can also look at look at the historical um, system state um, as well over time. And you can see this is not going to display everything, but we do get down here to um, timestamp number three, which is, uh, which is, of course, this last one that we iterated previous to that. We were on two. Um, so you could, uh, if you're not familiar with, with like, uh, Panda's data frame, right? We could um, we could say like uh, DF for data frame equals V3 show history, and then we can do uh, you know DF two CSV um, example that CSV, and uh, we'll just say index equals false, so it doesn't print a bunch of things. And this will basically export. Um, the, the table that we're looking at here to a CSV file, which you could um, 
you know, you could open in Excel or, or however you want to take a look at it if you're more comfortable working in, um, in something like Excel rather than Python to, to try to sort through what is included in this table. So with that said, I think we're right on time to, um, to end this session. Unless, Mark, do you have anything else to add? No, nothing else to add. I think that uh, there are a couple of things you touched on that, but we've really got up to, um, you know, we're, we're about to get into sort of the, the real, like, weeds of, um, of how the, the protocol operates. Uh, one of the things that you touched on there was about the EMS. And I'm wondering, um, I can't remember what uh, is on the schedule, but I, I think that it might be a good um, a good opportunity at the beginning of our next call um, to really explore what those EMAs are and, and how they work and um, you know, run like a few thousand trades or something um, really quickly just to sort of watch the, the EMA uh, change and, and demonstrate how it prevents exploits or something like that. If, um, if that wasn't already on the agenda, I'd like to, to add it. Um, but other than that, um, if anyone, I, I hope that um, you know the stuff that we mentioned at the beginning is, is going to cover um, people's sort of uh, Python words uh, that were expressed in the uh, in the chat earlier. Um, but other than that, I think I look forward to um, to seeing you here back next week. And um, yeah, I think that's it. Nothing else. Excellent. Thank you guys. Thank you everybody. And we will talk again soon. See you.